everyone. Welcome, welcome. We are so excited to have you as you're joining us. Open up your chat. Make sure it's sent to panelists and attendees and tell us where you are coming from. We're excited to have you. Alex, where are you living in again? Um, I'm living in currently in New Jersey, but uh, my fiance and I were living in New York City. We, we moved, out, uh, moved out around October. Ooh, perfect. Was that because of COVID or causation or uh... <laughs> um we uh we've been eyeing moving to the suburbs for a while i think like a lot of people covid probably accelerated that um so a, a little bit of covid a little bit of that was the plan that's awesome yeah we uh we've looked at moving up north but after after this snowstorm i don't know if i ever want to <laughs> live someplace with more uh more snow than i have to you probably so. you probably have a bad taste in your mouth about <laughs> any anywhere where there's a there's a worse <laughs> climate than texas right <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, hey, it's so great to see so many of you usuals popping up on here. We're so excited to have you. This is going to be an amazing session today. I was just looking through the deck. We've got so many incredibly powerful nuggets of information here, so we're so excited to have you. Before we get started, I'm going to throw up a poll. I want to hear from y'all. What is your role? Are you an SDR? Are you an AE? A team lead? A manager? Director? we got some C-levels. Great to have y'all here. Some good sales leaders, because this way we can really tailor our conversation and our questions today um, to make sure that you have exactly what you need to feel as successful as possible. So I'm going to leave this up here. Let's see. Alex, I think you can see the polls, right? Um, it popped up and then it went away. Okay. I'll show, it'll be fine. I'll share the results here in a bit. We've got a good amount of you that are current managers. Love that. Got some VPs, some directors. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to end the poll, share the results. Yeah, most of you are, some of you are managers, directors, VPs, C-level execs. We're so happy to have you. I already see some very familiar names, so I'm really happy to, to see all of you here today. I'm going to give it just a few minutes longer. Here we go. Okay. So I know we've got a jam-packed session today, so I want to make sure we have as much time as we need for it. Today, we are going to be talking all things optimizing your sales funnel, understanding your customers by just using different types of data, what that looks like. So we have a lot of great information for us today, um, and we're so thankful for SimilarWeb and um, for having them have sent Alex with us today. He's going to get into all the nitty gritty. So I will let you introduce yourself. Awesome. Thanks so much, Katie. Really excited to be here. So a little bit about myself. My name is Alex Lissenzon. I've been in client services for SaaS companies for about 10 years now, which is pretty crazy. Tom, time flies. Um, I started my career at a company called Wiser, which did algorithmic repricing. I was based in San Francisco then working with enterprise teams to really define their pricing strategy on e-com platforms and marketplaces. And uh, about four years ago, um, I joined SimilarWeb, where I currently am a principal account manager. I support about five of our largest Fortune 50 uh, client partnerships. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with SimilarWeb, so, so we're actually a market intelligence platform. We provide insights into consumers' digital behaviors online. And traditionally, SimilarWeb was very much a platform for marketeers, right? It was about understanding your competitors, um, competing e-com players, how big are they? How does that compare to you? You know, where are they getting their traffic from? What can you learn about their strategies to inform your customer acquisition? And what we noticed about five years ago was that we were having these kind of peripheral use cases start to pop up. And one of those that was really prevalent was sales, right? And a lot of our cu customers started using our data to fuel their sales strategies. A lot of the data inputs that we have, uh, you know, metrics around web traffic and, and what markets that traffic is coming from, things like that, can be used as really effective sales signals. And so we pivoted our business a little bit and released a, a, an entire suite of products really focused on sales teams called SimilarWeb Sales Solutions. 
So where I sit within the similar web, uh, similar business is I support our customers specifically focused on sales use cases. So I have the privilege of working with literally thousands of salespeople that are using our data as well as other data sources um, and, and really get to be exposed to how they're approaching sales, how they're approaching strategy for their sales teams and their reps and, and how they're executing to, to deliver on their, on their objectives and their goals. Before we get into today's content, because we, we do have a, a bunch to go through, I wanted to give a quick shout that we'll be doing a little bit of a giveaway of some swag. So um, post your favorite tip that we're going to be covering today on LinkedIn. Make sure you tag similar web, similar webinar and sales. And we're going to be picking two posters that we're going to send some swag to. So someone from our team will reach out afterwards. So just keep that in mind. If you want to get some free swag, it's a really great way to do it. So let's get into it, right? So in working with all these salespeople, I've been exposed to some kind of shifts, I would say, in, in sales leaders' mentalities. And I think that, you know, this is probably not new to folks on the line. I think, you know, when Katie and I were preparing for this, she was like, you know, a lot of this is kind of like common sense, but it really needs to be, needs to be said. And, and so there's really kind of three main themes that I've been seeing more than anything. One is a desire to be more data-driven. So this is a bit of a broad phrase, right? Everyone wants to be more data-driven in theory. But where this really comes into play in the conversations I have with salespeople is that it's not just being able to track what's happening with your internal data. That can actually be a whole separate webinar if, if Katie wants to facilitate that. But it's also about incorporating external data to produce more predictable and repeatable results. And, and we're going to be talking about these themes throughout today's, today's webinar. In a similar capacity, right, number two here is optimizing inefficiencies. The challenge is that what you take, when you take a purely internal focused approach, you might be missing the real why. Why are certain prospects moving efficiently through your sales funnel to closed one opportunities and why are others not? Or why are certain leads more responsive to outbound in a certain time? Or even from an inbound perspective, what are the commonalities in the pipeline your sales team is generating? These are all questions that you can really start to answer when you incorporate external intelligence throughout your sales funnel. And then lastly, and certainly not least, is, is a realized need for differentiation, right? So we live in a very kind of congested world, as I would call it, or saturated world. There's hundreds, if not thousands of businesses selling to exactly the same leads. Even if you are the only company that does exactly what you do or provides a very unique value to your prospects, you are still competing with all the companies trying to sell to your same buyer. So you have all these competitors, right, that, that might be in totally different lines of business, but you're all competing for that share of voice, for, for breaking through the noise. So you need a way for your, reps, for your reps to really cut through that and differentiate themselves in their outreach. You know, the, the best subject lines in the world are only going to get you so far. And you can have the best sales team in the game, but if your reps aren't getting conversations, they're not going to be able to close business. So all of these really highlight the need for external intelligence. And, and what I really want to discuss today is how we can use data to solve for these kind of themes that we're seeing in the market. So what is external intelligence? Um, I'll confess, I made this definition up as well as some others throughout this presentation, but I think it gets the point across nicely. External intelligence for sales is information that provides insight into the inner workings, performance, strategy, et cetera, of your prospects and customers. This is purposely vague because external intelligence can encompass a wide range of types of data. This can be anything ranging from, you know, 10K reports, which are really great for publicly traded companies, if that's who you're selling to, to web traffic data, you know, that's our specialty at SimilarWeb, to news reporting, traditional research like surveys, firmographics, you know, information about the business itself and their headcounts, stuff like that, technographics, the list goes on. There's hundreds and hundreds of types of external intelligence. And one of the key things coming out of today is that, you know, as much as we can guide you on, on the value of using external intelligence, it's really up to you as an individual team or individual sales leader to determine what type of external intelligence is going to be most valuable for your team. So the purpose of today's discussion is to really talk about how can external intelligence help you optimize your sales funnel. And we're going to cover three distinct tips for where to incorporate it and why it's important to do so. So tip number one, 
using external intelligence to rethink your ideal customer profile. So here we're going to start at the very, very top of your sales funnel. Before we reach out to leads or even find leads, we need to know what kind of prospects we're looking for, right? Who's going to have the highest propensity to buy your product or service? So let's start without external intelligence, right? The old version of the ideal customer profile. I'm going to use a really, really simple example, a payment solution business. So who would be the ideal customer or who would, what would be the ideal customer profile of a payment solution? So the obvious assumption would probably be, you know, an online merchant, right? They need to sell something online in order to accept payments. So this is sort of the minimum threshold for a viable prospect. Um, a payment in solution in most cases generates revenue by taking a cut of a transaction. So your business model is obviously going to play a role here. And we need to assume some minimum amount of revenue done by the businesses we would be, we would be targeting. It's probably also not very prudent to go after the largest companies in the world. So, so we have an upper limit there as well, right? Annual revenues of 10 million to 500 million. And depending on where my payment solution sales team is, assuming it's in one market, we are probably going to start with focusing on businesses headquartered there. So we can take the U.S. as an example. Now here, right away, we can start to understand and talk about why taking this simple, uh, this simple of a mentality about your ideal customer profile can have some real challenges. This type of approach assumes that all your prospects are created equal. It doesn't matter what line of business they are in or what their current business circumstance is. And this is, uh, I think, really highlighting the need for external intelligence. Taking this type of approach ignores external factors that are going to directly impact your prospects' willingness and ability to buy. The, the bottom line is that the world is really not static. It's extremely dynamic. Uh, we actually pulled a data point from SimWeb that I think emphasizes this really well. Every single month, over 1 million websites are born and 300,000 vanish, never to be seen or heard from again. I added that last part. So how can your ICP remain stagnant, right? If your prospect's world is constantly changing. Let's illustrate this with a slightly more tangible and relatable example. So COVID. COVID completely changed the business landscape in an unpredictable and unimaginable way. What we saw was this massive shift in entire industries. Some flourished, video conferencing, like Zoom that we're on here now, some totally dissipated, like travel that had an enormously difficult time as restrictions kicked in and, and uh, people were forced to stay at home, not even travel outside their homes, let alone to other countries or cities. And what we're looking at here is a view of SimilarWeb's data looking at year-over-year -year growth and decline by industry in the U.S. As the world became used to the new normal, who your sales team was going to have success selling to changed enormously as well. We saw this firsthand. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit of anecdote specific to, to similar and what our sales team went through. So right when COVID hit, we had released a new product that was awesome. Like one of the coolest things we've ever made. But it was geared on insights specific to hotel and accommodation bookings. So we literally built a whole new tool just for travel companies. And the timing obviously could not have been worse. But by using external intelligence, we're, we were able to recognize the changes happening in the market and efficiently pivot. This meant entirely changing the priority of what types of leads our sales team was going after. But this also meant from a retention perspective, and I think it's important throughout this conversation to kind of continue thinking about it from both sides, right? Not just the new business side, but also how you're retaining and supporting your customers. From a retention perspective, it meant shifting our focus to industries where we knew our customers were struggling offering them additional support, helping them leverage our data to optimize their own strategies during this tumultuous time, and ultimately doubling down from an account management support perspective to help those who needed us most. We also implemented pricing changes and incentives to help specific customers, things like that, right? And I feel this is a really great example of, of how our team coped and used external intelligence in an actionable way to adjust our strategy. So let's take a step back and kind of generalize what we're saying, right? What should your ideal customer profile really be? So again, I'm making up my own definition here, but I think it works. Your ideal customer profile should be the intersection of the value you can provide and the opportunity that exists in the market at that time. And I think that last piece is what's really, really critical here. It's right, it's what opportunity exists at the time. And this is constantly evolving. 
So let's go back to our example of that payment company, right? The payment solution I, I was speaking to before. With external intelligence, we can redefine that ideal customer profile. And again, this is something that's constantly evolving. But perhaps a more effective way to think about your ideal customer profile in this scenario is to say, yes, we are looking for online merchants, but we want to focus on industries that are growing, like consumer goods, restaurant delivery, and online retail. And while annual revenue requirements might remain unchanged, we need to break that down not by what historical revenues were, because those might not longer be relevant and might be totally wrong. So now we want to add a new layer to that, right? Something that we can track, like how many purchases are happening per month on that merchant's website. We can still focus on the business headquartered in the U.S., but we can also incorporate additional data points where we know our business might have a strong fit, right? Going back to that value that you can provide point. So for example, if our payment solution supports cross-border payments, maybe it's finding prospects that are operating in at least two markets because that's going to give us an opportunity to be an even stronger value driver for those businesses. Or maybe if we have an easy integration with a specific e-commerce platform like Magento or Shopify, it's focusing on prospects that are built on those. And again, this is going to be vastly different for every type of sales team, right? It's about deciding what data points you really need to know about your customers that are going to help you find the right prospects to be reaching out to. So this leads us to tip number two. So now you've defined your new ideal customer profile, and we need to shift our focus to using external intelligence to prioritize your efforts. Your team has a lot of leads. This is supposed to be a good thing, right? Um, I can tell you, you know, for example, in SimilarWeb, we, we have no shortage of leads. But having a plethora of leads is not always a good thing. The number of hours in a day don't change. And just because you have more leads, it doesn't mean your reps know where to be focusing their time and their efforts. And your reps probably feel something like this, right? Lead overload. We all know this feeling. You have all these leads. You just don't know where to start. So I think this is another critical opportunity to incorporate external intelligence to your sales process. External intelligence is not just about defining who the right lead is, but it's also about determining which lead you should reach out to at what time. How do you go after the lowest hanging fruit? What data points can you incorporate that will allow you to hit your sales quota? And how do you differentiate between what you think you should be going after versus who you should actually be going after? I think this is probably a challenge that every single sales rep has, right? The, you have all these leads and you just don't know where to start. So the easiest mistake here, oops, easiest mistake here is to focus on the largest businesses first, right? I definitely have fallen into this trap myself. If you want to reach out to someone, the biggest revenue potential comes from the biggest companies. So let's start there. The idea is really outdated, though, because who you might have thought was the best or biggest company might actually not be the case anymore. And size is really not everything. Let's take this example that I brought up here. And this is another, an, another example of similar web uh, data looking at year over year uh, visitation for a Russian retailer, Lamoda. This is a substantially sized retailer, 15 million monthly visits uh, to their website in January of 2020. But if you're using old information, like you know, publicly reported data or something you found about the business and them saying, you know, here's what our traffic is at this point in time, you're really only seeing part of the story. The reality is that this business lost about a third of its web traffic and appears to be on a downward trajectory, right? And this is why taking one you know, point of time data point like size is really not, not sufficient. It's, it's not enough to decide where you should be prioritizing your efforts. So Alex, we did have a question come up and I love it, it kind of a little bit behind, but whenever okay. we're talking about buying signals for prospects, what do we do if mm -hmm. we don't have one? How can we kind of create it so that we can kind of start that the the buyer's journey for that prospect? How do we really create that value and need? Drive the urge. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, I think it, it really goes back to first truly understanding where do you have the biggest opportunity to help your prospects, right? 
if that opportunity to help is a company that's gone through XYZ changes, then you need to find data that's going to help you identify those businesses, right? And that's why I use that payment example because you have to go a little bit deeper than just top line general characteristics of businesses. You really need to sit down and think about where is our ability to impact our prospects in a positive way? Because if we identify the businesses that align best with what we're offering, we're going to have a much easier time selling to them. And it's not about casting the widest net. It's about casting you know, the, the, the most accurate net, if that's an expression, right? We want to make sure we're targeting the right businesses that we actually have a really great fit for. And once we determine what those characteristics are, going into the market and finding the data points that are going to allow us to target those. Any other questions so far? Nope, we're good. Awesome. Please interrupt me if questions come in because the view I have, I'm not seeing the, the chat. Sure. Yeah, will do. Cool. Um, so, so going back to this example, right? Who would you rather your, 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 uh, your sales team focus? Would you rather them focus on LaModa, who's down 30% in traffic year over year and, 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 and losing, their, losing their visitor base? Or if we take an example like UGG, that is at exactly the same size as LaModa is now, but they saw an 80% increase from January 20 to January 21. And by the way, it could be the total opposite, right? Some sales teams that I work with at, at our customers at SimilarWeb actually prefer focusing on prospects that are seeing a decline in business because that's their opportunity to provide value. This is definitely not a one-size-fits-all, right? It's about applying the data to what value there is for you to help businesses or what your value is to support businesses in the market environment. Mm. And size is just one example. There's a, there's a couple more here, but there's literally hundreds, right? International market growth. Here we're looking at ASOS and we see that they see really strong growth in certain countries like Georgia, Morocco, Norway, et cetera, right? Maybe those markets are where you have a really strong value proposition for your customers. And so this data point is super powerful for you to know and for you to prioritize your outreach based on. Maybe this actually makes ASOS totally irrelevant for your offering, right? So it could either disqualify or qualify your prospects. It, it, it's not about a one-size-fits-all. What, what's super relevant data for one business might be totally irrelevant for another business. And then the other example I found here was, was news announcements, right? So, I mean, I think at this point, every sales rep I, I speak to has, you know, Google Alerts set up and they're, they're seeing when their prospects are mentioned in the news. And I think that's a really great example of external intelligence too. Walmart announced they're offering free delivery with Walmart Plus. Maybe suddenly this makes Walmart a great prospect for you. Maybe you have something to do or you're selling something that has, you know, really good uh, a, a really good um, synergy with with free delivery. You know, I don't know. It doesn't, or maybe this makes them totally irrelevant for you. Again, it, it's about deciding for yourselves what data points are most critical for you to find the right prospects and and prioritize your outreach and focusing on those. So one of the things that I see a lot, especially with less tenured reps is that they'll do all this research, but they don't know how to compile it or they just do so much and then it's research paralysis. And it's like, oh my gosh, I know all this, but I haven't even called them. How do I know it's worth it? So what are like some, are these the three key things that you would focus on whenever you're doing research or like, what would you recommend would be, you know, top two or three things to look for whenever you're, you're prospecting? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. You know, one of the, one of the, Something we don't, I didn't mention in this deck, but definitely feedback I get from especially very senior sales leaders is like, look, I don't need my reps to spend a ton of time researching, right? I want them to find just the right data points and use just the data points they need. And, mm -hmm. and that's, I think, a really, really fair, fair position to take. I, I would actually totally agree with that. So again, I think it all goes back to the sales leaders and them determining for their team that these are the data points we need to focus on, right? And maybe it's no more than that. Maybe it's enough that you just know, you know, the web traffic of all of your prospects and how that's changing month over month. 
Or maybe it's enough to know what e-commerce platform all of your prospects are built on. Or maybe it's enough to know what kind of shipping options they offer on their site or whatever it is, right? The idea is that you as a sales leader need to be the driving force to help your team determine that and then facilitate your team having access to the right data and just that data. They don't need to spend hours and hours researching every prospect, especially before they've even had a first conversation, right? That's not going to be efficient. But if they have a way to, in a scaled approach, especially enrich their data or enrich their prospects with just the right data points in a really quick and easy way, then that can make or break their entire workflow because now they're getting to the office or in today's world, migrating from their bedroom to their living room, right? They're, they're, they're starting their day and they know who they should be reaching out to and who's going to be the best fit in that moment for what it is they have to offer. Awesome. Good, good points there. Rory popped up a question uh, whenever we're looking at data points. Does similar web collect sessions or just visits per page views? What does that look like? Yeah, great question. So SimWeb has a wide range of metrics. I think we have something like 150 different data points that we offer for every website. We do um, estimate sessions. So how many visits in total happened on a website, similar to how Google Analytics does. We also collect data around and and provide data around how long consumers spend on sites, how many pages they're visiting, how they got there, all different different types of uh, types of stuff. Okay, cool. Thank you. Awesome. <clears throat> so now let's move on to, to number three, right? And I think this is probably my favorite if I had to choose, although I'm somewhat impartial. I think they're all pretty important. So tip number three is to use external intelligence to be consultative in your outreach. It's one thing to know about your prospects and it's another to make them realize you have an understanding of their business and are able to help them accomplish whatever it is that you've set out to with your product or service or whatever you're offering, right? So like we did with the ideal customer profile, let's go through two examples here. One where we don't use external intelligence and one where we do. So without external intelligence, here's an outbound email to a prospect where the rep is not applying any sort of external intelligence at all. Hi prospect, nice to meet you. My name is jo- my name is John Smith and I'm an account executive at Random Company where we help businesses do XYZ. We do this by offering feature 1, feature 2, feature 3. Are you available for a 30-minute call tomorrow to discuss implementing our solution for your business? Um, This comes across as just purely spray and pray, right? As people say these days. Here's what our solution does. Um, I don't care about you as a customer or a prospect. Maybe I do, but I'm certainly not showing it. If I'm on the receiving end of this email and I get tons of these, whether over LinkedIn or over email every single week, I could tell right away the rep knows absolutely nothing about my business. So it's even worse if the rep does know something about my business and they've taken the time to research it because that's just not coming across here. So then you're just wasting your time as a rep because you're not conveying that you've done your homework or that you know anything about this prospect in your reach out. Hmm. So let's take a look at another example. Oops with external intelligence. So here we're gonna be leading with a different approach where we're saying, I know, here's what I know about your business and here's how I can help. Hi prospect, nice to meet you. I noticed you were starting to enter A and B additional markets, both countries who specialize in with our services, so I figured I'd reach out. My name is John Smith and I'm an account executive at Random Company where we help businesses do X, Y, Z. Since you're already using Magento as your e-commerce platform, Integrating our solution will only take about 15 minutes. We offer a native plugin to make things more efficient. Are you available for a 30-minute call tomorrow to discuss further and see how we might be able to help? So, again, this is not, you know, a one-size-fits-all. Maybe it's totally different data points for the folks on the line and the stuff they're selling that's going to be the most relevant. But the bottom line is that the rep here is saying, here's what I know about your business. I took the time to learn about your business, and I think I can actually help for these specific reasons, right? This is not a one-size-fits-all. I just want to make that super clear, right? And so it's important, going back to the beginning, to really determine what is the right external intelligence for you to focus on based on what you're actually offering. But you need to find the right the right data points that are going to enable your team with the right insights for consultative outreach. 
And the, the results, I'm sure, will speak for themselves, right? And I know that, you know, when I'm working with the sales teams at these large companies, this has become a, a pivotal part of their outreach, right? It's not just about finding the data, and it doesn't all come from SimilarWeb. They use a variety of sources. You know, these are large, large sales teams. Mm -hmm. SimilarWeb is just one input they're using. But it's not just about finding that data, but it's being able to articulately speak to that and speak to those data points so that you can get, break through the noise with your prospects and make them realize that whatever you're selling is going to help them because you truly understand their business. So I, I want to kind of dig into a little bit about this email because there are some there's some features in here and some discussion points that I think would be worth us spending a little bit of time on. Um, in one of the last paragraphs you put, since you are already using Magento as your e-commerce platform, wouldn't that be a little weird? How do they know that we know? Is that weird? How do we avoid that that weirdness? Well, I, I think I think you uh, you have to find the right balance, right? Um, you know, this is a tactic that we use really often at Similar Web, and that I, I see our customer sales teams using mm -hmm. too. It's about finding the right line. Um, I don't think it's a secret, you know, what e-com platform someone's built on. Or, yeah. hey, I see that you accept these types of payment options today. Or, hey, I noticed that your site is translatable to these seven languages, but not this eighth, ninth, and tenth. And maybe we sell a language translation service mm. for your site, right? So, so I think it's just about finding the right data points, right? And, and this is just a, an ad hoc example going off the e-com platform, but... You know, it, it can be anything. It can be, hey, I see that you offer these three currencies, right? We offer a solution to accept Bitcoin payment. That's very front of mind today for people. Or, you know, I noticed that you don't have a next day air logistics option, right? We offer that and we'd be happy to support that for your business or whatever it is. I think that it's just about finding where your sweet spot is and what data can help you articulately speak to that. Yeah. I, you know, one thing I've really appreciated about this is just as, as you've been talking, and I'm sure everyone else has, has been thinking about this too, but my brain's just been running on, on different ways that we could leverage this type of information. And um, one of the things that kind of popped up was how using this external intelligence would be so incredibly beneficial in not just nurture campaigns, but, but marketing campaigns, right? Is that something that we see a lot of? Is that encouraged or where does that fit with it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Account-based marketing. I mean, this can be huge for that, right? You take all of your prospects, enrich them with specific data points, and then set up campaigns to target them with messaging that resonates based on those specific data points, right? You put them into different mm -hmm. cohorts. That's a, that's a really great application of this. Also, I feel like a lot of this, we've been talking about new business sales, but just going back to the account management use case too, right? The world is very dynamic. Things are changing. Your customers' businesses are changing. How do you know what else you should be offering them that can be, you know, an additional service that they can tack on to their subscription with you? Or how do you know if a customer's industry is in a really bad spot and they're suddenly becoming a churn risk for you and you need to double down on supporting them or, or have, a, you know, an extra QBR, EBR session with them, right? This can be applied at every step of the sales funnel from, you know, demand generation and lead gen at the very top all the way through to me making sure that you're retaining your customers and, and, and you're boosting your retention numbers by using this type of data as well. Yeah. And you know what I think is really cool, too? Um, first off, for those of you wondering why I'm asking so many questions, I've worked at companies before where we had nothing. So like the level of intent data or external intelligence I was able to get was based off of what I found on LinkedIn, not LinkedIn sales navigator, but having to go and find my prospect and see what they're posting. And then hopefully drawing the right conclusion that this is important to them. So I think that this is so incredibly interesting. I also wonder, um, you know, we talked a little bit about how this can work in marketing, but I'm also curious on how, how these trends can be used to forecast churn. So like, I wonder if, you know, we take customer one, two, three, four, five, and three of the five customers all came from this platform and migrated to our platform. And two of the three 
churned after a year, I wonder if you could like use that information to try and, and plan like a better nurturing sequence for, you know, customer success and um, maybe create like a better buyer's journey for them and a better customer's journey. So that way they're able to, you're able to hold on to them. But I wonder like what other ways are you seeing this information used inside of an organization? Yeah, so I, I think that's a that's a that's a really interesting example. I would actually probably say that's more of an internal excel internal intelligence data mm. point rather than an external one, right? Because maybe they already told you, look, here's the 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 platform we switched to to come to yours, right? And so you yeah. are running that in your you know Salesforce. You have a field there for their previous uh, platform, and and you're doing some analyses based on that, right? But but I would think about it more of like you know, what else can you know about their business, yeah. right? So maybe two of those three that churned, you know, going back to the COVID example, maybe they their business has something to do with travel. And so it was actually nothing to do with your product or your satisfaction. Maybe their business is just having a tough time, right? Or maybe, you know, there was a new competitor popped up in the market that took all of their all of their market share and and that's been a really a really tough point for them and you know you're recognizing that about their business and preparing for that um maybe that's by doubling down your efforts and supporting them from a retention perspective maybe that's by you know kind of cutting your losses and saying look we need to focus on the customers we know we can save because there are external factors here that we're just not going to be able to overcome i think these are all decisions you have to make as a business but they have to be informed decisions right you have to know what you're looking for you have to see the signals in the market and you have to be able to uh be be able to incorporate that into your strategy and, and it's an evolving practice it's an evolving situation you know one of the things that our CRO did, which which I really loved, when COVID hit, we were having a, a every two weeks a session with different salespeople across different parts of our business. So SMB sales, mid market enterprise across different regions, and it was really a collaboration of what are what are the trends we're seeing in the market, right? What are we seeing happening with our customers and prospects? What is the feedback we're getting? And and I think that that kind of um, inquisitive kind of mentality is something that should be you know, continuously permeating, right? And and there are things that are you're going to just hear, hey, my customer said that, you know, the fashion industry is getting crushed for XYZ reasons, or, you know, because of COVID, people are only shopping online. My customers are only operating brick and mortar stores. This is going to be disastrous for them. Other things are going to be happening because you're reading stuff in the news about a particular industry, or you're seeing particular data points like traffic stats or or revenue growth numbers, right? Or or 10K reports, whatever it is. I think that it's just about having the right mentality of we need to truly understand what's happening in our prospects' environments and what's happening around them so that we can ensure we're positioned the right way, whether that's you know, rethinking what who your ideal customer is and, and who you're going after, right? Where you prioritize your efforts or even how you're reaching out, like like we talked about in this example here. Hmm. Yeah, I really like that. And I think for me, one of my favorite tips from this session was tip number two. So using external intelligence to really prioritize your efforts. Um, one thing that I really love about this, and I think a lot of a lot of sellers and a lot of managers, right? This isn't just for sellers. This is for you as a manager to train your teams how to do is, you know, whenever you think about how you get your leads, you just get a whole slew of them, right? <laughs> it's, oh, they showed up in my sales force and they're now tied to my name. And a lot of times as reps, we may not even know that we have leads until we get a call from our manager saying, why is your forecast so wonky? <laughs> what happened to it? And so I think that this is a really cool opportunity to really evaluate and know like what's happening. And I think as sellers, like there's a lot of times where we really don't know what's happening. Like, let's just be honest here. We think it's going to close, but how often do we actually know it's going to close? Uh, I may just be speaking for myself here, but, yeah, but definitely really. Definitely not. Definitely not. <laughs> and I think this is a really cool thing because by using this information, we're able to actually say, oh, no, I know exactly where this is at and I can run specific campaigns. You know, if I find out that let's say I work for um, a cybersecurity company and I find out that like the bigger cybersecurity company that I'm always competing with has just lost, you know, 200 employees. They're going through all this stuff. I can run campaigns around like 
what products these people are using. Um, and I think that is like so incredibly cool because I would be able to like really understand like where is my pipeline uh, and really understanding what that looks like. Yeah. A hundred percent. I also think it's, uh, I, I, I also think that it's like, you know, you, you have to own your time as a salesperson, right? You have a certain amount of hours in the day. And I think that every sales leader, while they can provide guidance at the end of the day, they have to, they have to instill the right mentality in their team about how they need to be approaching their own book of business. Right. I think the, the common common uh, saying is you're the CEO of your own book of business and you, and you own your outcomes, you own your results, right? And, and if you want to approach that in a strategic way, you don't want to just be, you know, just hitting the phones and just dialing any any person. You need to start thinking about what external data points can can help you in your efforts, can help make sure you're reaching out to the right prospect at the right time. Maybe the company that just had a huge round of layoffs and is declaring bankruptcy is not necessarily the best prospect and aren't going to be ready to buy whatever it is you're selling. Or maybe you offer bankruptcy protection services and they're exactly the right prospect for you to be going after. It's 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 going to be unique to every everyone on the line here. It's going to be unique to what you're selling. It's going to be unique to who you're selling it to and to the market dynamics that are constantly evolving. Yeah, I think that's so, so incredibly interesting. And I think what one of the things you just said too, market dynamics are constantly evolving. I think that's something uh, in sales that we don't always think about is based on recent events, how has this affected the people I sell to? It's like your example of selling into COVID and travel. <laughs> obviously isn't going to go very well <laughs> because it's it's not a need for them. Um, but I think really paying attention to what's happening to your specific industries, like you said in tip number one, like really understanding your ICP and who it is. You know, you, you said at the intersection of the value you can provide and the opportunity that exists in the market at that time, I think that those last three words at that time. So I, I think this is kind of an interesting discussion to be had. And I'd be curious your thoughts. Do you think that your ICP is fluid? Do you think that it is always, you know, this, we always go after doctors. So this is what we'll always do. Or do you think it's fluid? I think it's absolutely fluid. I think it's, it's changing all the time. I mean, maybe not every hour or every day, but, but it's changing like the world changes, right? Yeah. Let's take, you know, a, a, an example like uh, like ZocDoc, for example, you know, go, just playing off your your doctor one, right? If I'm ZocDoc and I'm figuring out who I should be going after, am I going after doctors that have some sort of an online presence first or not, right? That's, a, that's an interesting data point. Is that list evolving constantly? Absolutely, right? Doctors are deciding to promote themselves online or not, right? That's going to be changing uh, the dynamic for my sales team, right? If, if, I'm a doctor during COVID, what does that mean for a company like ZocDoc, right? Or if you take a totally different business, maybe you are a platform that, that helps barbers, helps you find a barber, right? Are you, if something like COVID happens, right? Are you going to be prioritizing barbers that offer at-home services? I know that was a really big, really big trend that emerged in New York because barber shops were closed and that wasn't really an option. And so people started to get their haircuts at home. Like there's just, it, it changes all the time. And COVID is just, you know, the very front of mind example, but this can happen in anything, right? Industries are constantly evolving. We take an example like Toys R Us. Toys R Us was a massive retailer. Everyone knew it. Everyone loved it. And they just didn't keep up with, digital trends. And so they ended up going away, right? Toys R Us may have been your prospect. Maybe if you're Hasbro, that's where you're focusing your efforts or if you're selling toys, right? And then you realize that that's actually not the best prospect for you anymore because they, they haven't been doubling down on their strategy. And that's why it's so important to know about your prospects at a really deep level. Yeah, that's so interesting. Man, that Toys R Us example, I don't know about y'all. I forgot about them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I forgot about them as a business. Wow, I think this is so interesting. You know, we've talked about redefining our ICP. We agree that it can be fluid. So I think that's something as reps, like you said earlier, we really need to own the responsibility of seeing what does that mean for for our, who we're targeting. What does that mean for our prospect accounts? How do our prospect accounts evolve? How do we utilize information to help evolve with with how we 
prospect into some of these accounts. Um, one of the last questions I have, I know I've been taking up a lot of time, but um, what are some other ways that you've seen reps utilize this information in prospecting? Like with LinkedIn connections, do they, um, you know, use this information and then start kind of sending content around it? What does that usually look like? Yeah, I mean, d definitely, right? Like, I think, I think um, a really easy example is just industry. Just you know, a really basic characteristic of a business is the industry they play in, and, and what industries you're going to be focusing on as a sales team is going to be changing based on what industries are growing. Maybe it's fashion apparel, maybe it's consumables, maybe it's you know, grocery delivery, whatever it is. So, I think that. If you know that, that's the industry you want to target, right? You've used external intelligence. You've determined this industry is growing. This is where I'm going to be focusing my efforts, right? That's going to then resonate. That's going to then transcend across your whole process, right? It's going to be on LinkedIn. What types of businesses are you looking for? Are you looking for grocery delivery businesses? Are you looking for fashion brands, fashion retailers, right? Whatever it is. How are you reaching out? Are you reaching out with, here's a general, here's what our service or, or offering does? Or are you saying, here's how we help, you know, fashion and apparel businesses. Here's how we help um, grocery delivery businesses, right? He, I noticed that you're doing X, Y, Z, and here's how we can help you in that effort, right? So absolutely. I think I think it goes across your entire, your entire sales process, right? Every single step from who you're reaching out to, to how you're reaching out and when you're reaching out is going to be fueled by external intelligence. Yeah. I think one of my favorite ways to use this type of information and like intent data is... Um, Whenever I'm prospecting, you know, I know y'all would crucify me for this, but some something along the lines of, you know, hey, I just talked to the school down the street from you. This is something that they're really struggling with in leveraging that external intelligence in that discussion. Um, so that's been something super helpful for me. We do have a question, and and I think that this is super helpful too. Uh, you know, similar web has an amazing Chrome extension, super helpful. Uh, as far as the full tool, how does it compare to other insights out there? You know, I know Zoom Info's got a bunch of intent data that you can check out, um, set up alerts, stuff like that. So, w where do we see similar web come in above par with those areas? Yeah. So, look, I mean, the, the the purpose of today's session is really not about you know just demoing similar web if, if it were i would have just opened up the platform and we could have started there but it's it's really about impressing upon everyone that it, the type of data that you need is going to vary tremendously right um personally i think that you know similar web is really great obviously i'm, I'm a huge fan i work here i love it um zoom info is really great too i i don't think it's a one or the other i think if you need you know contact details to use a certain service if you understand market trends and and specific business performance and, and how things are trending or technographics maybe you use similar web for those right so so i i don't think it's a one or the other i think just about where are the gaps in your intelligence today um, we work with sales teams that just use us for our traffic data. We work with sales teams that only use us for our e-com platform and shipping provider data. We use, you know, sales teams that only use us for their for our affiliate data and what sites are sending traffic to other sites and you know what does the coupon and rebate landscape look like at a certain market, something like that. So I think it just first starts with understanding what questions you need to. Uh, ask in order to have a better understanding of your prospects and then what data can help you really understand that right w what can really help you come to come to the table with a clear picture of who you should be reaching out to and how you should be reaching out to them yeah that's really great well I know we've only got a few minutes left here so um, before we go to Two top things. If, if if you could send everyone with just two things. I know we've got three tips, but if you had to summarize it in two points, what would that look like? Yeah, good question. You're really making me drop one of these, huh? <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I think number one is like, I'll actually go away from the three tips I had. I'll, 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 I'll reposition it a little bit. I'll say, Take a step back and really try to understand what it is you don't know about your prospects and customers, right? 
I think that it's really easy to look at internal data and, and see the outcome of your results, right? We closed 20% of deals. We had 10,000 prospects we sent outbound to, et cetera. But if you want to excel as a sales team or as an account management team or as a sales leader or revenue leader at your business, you need to take a step back and you need to try to understand the why behind that. And the why behind that is not something you're always going to see with your internal data. It's going to, it's going to come with discussions and it's going to come with external data points, right? Um, so I think that's, that's really number one. Number two is I think you need to really think about going to tip number three of like, how are you going to cut through the noise, right? How are you going to grab the attention of your prospects? And, and going back to a comment I made earlier, it's not just going to be a catchy subject line. Maybe I've seen some really good ones and it, it works. I opened the emails, but, but you know, it's about the person who can reach out to me and clearly help me understand that what they're offering is a fit for me for whatever reason, right? It's because I have a certain pain that they've identified or an opportunity that I have that they've identified. And that's going to, you know, hit that light bulb. And I'm going to have that moment where I'm going to say, wow, this is worth me responding to. This could be really interesting. And, and I think that finding that right balance of data in your outreach, right? That, that, that balance of, not just spray and pray, but also have a ta you know a tactical approach where it's personalized and and you've shown that you've done some level of research is it's going to go a long way. Wow, those are some good nuggets. I really yeah, I'm a huge fan as should everyone be of um, making it as custom and personalized and using external intelligence like this makes it just so much easier, helps you avoid being shamed on social media for your horrible prospecting. So, uh, wow, super, super great information. Um, I don't know if we have any more questions. So before we head out today, is there anything else that you would recommend? Any thoughts, ideas, anything like that that you want to share just one last time? No, I, th I think we covered it all. Um, you'll be sharing the deck with the uh, attendees, right? So, so feel free to to when you share that out. There's some more information about similar up there. There's a way to get in contact if you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn to discuss any of this further. Love talking about this stuff. So feel feel free to reach out, everyone. And thank you so much, Katie, for having me. It was it was a real pleasure. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. And thank you so much, Similar Web. Hey, everyone, don't forget, this will be sent out within 24 hours of this session. So keep an eye on your email. You'll be getting the on-demand webinar, the deck. Um, you can also always check it out at saleshacker.com under training and events within 24 hours. So with that said, I hope you all stay safe, stay warm, and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks, Katie. Take care, everyone.